two thoughts have been going through my um, brain a lot over the last uh, week. I, I, I like having things to think about, and the two things that I've been teasing out of my are two sort of design-related uh, issues. One is this notion of um, a big design up front versus an incremental design. And I keep thinking about that because, of course, the 1970s programmer in me, the top-down programmer in me, the first-year programmer, programmer in me, really wants to do a big design up front before I start on anything. And I just, you know, it's very hard to convince myself that an iterative design will lead to the outcome I want. And the second thing I keep thinking about is the, is the fact that we're now in the middle of the course. Because this middle blues that every course seems to have, maybe you're not having it or maybe you are, but I, I think I get it in the middle of a course, seems to me to be common to every course I've ever taught. Now you guys are in the middle of your degree, you're in second year. That's the middle too. So you're in the middle of a course, in the middle of second year, the whole yucky middle. In the middle of a poem is crap, in the middle of a film can be crap, in the middle of a series of books can be crap. So what I've been doing as an experiment over the last seven days is I've been reading as many series as I can. I've got lots of series of books. I've been reading the middle books, trying to work out what the heck's going on in the middle. And I've been looking around for people in their university degrees that are blogging, and I've been looking at students who are in the middle of their degree. And I've been thinking about a lot of my friends that are having a midlife crisis. Because this whole middle thing is really hard. So let me try and summarize, I think, what is in, in common with this middle. I think at the beginning, everything's exciting. No matter what it is. Love, life, a course, a degree, anything. A film, a book. Everything's exciting. And at the end, everything comes to a conclusion. And it sort of gets exciting too. And in a lecture, it's the same too. Yeah, it's more interesting in the very end, it's more interesting in the very beginning, in the middle, it's a blah. And I, I've just been thinking why that is and how to deal with it and things like that. So one of the thoughts that I've had is I think actually being in the middle is a blessing in some ways because you don't have the excitement of the beginning and you don't have the sort of rush of the end. So you can stand back and think about things. And that's a good chance to reflect. So, Rather than getting burned out, which I think happens if you're just working really hard the whole way through and there's no chance to reflect, I think you should grab this opportunity in the middle of the course and in the middle of your degree to think about things, to step back and find some space, to somehow shed some of the clutters that are cluttering your mind and just think about things. Now let me tell you um, a personal revelation that years and years ago I was, uh, uh, what's the technical name, a girly swat. I was, um, I went to university and I went through school and I did well and strives hard and got good marks and I thought what I wanted to do when I grow up was just be really rich and successful and famous. That was all. And I worked really, really hard and I got lots of scholarships and lots of glory and things and I became an actuary and they're very, very, very well paid people. And, um, and I passed the exams and I became a partner in a firm, and not an equity partner, but on the track to becoming an equity partner. And I became very rich and very, very successful. And by 25, I owned a couple of houses and I had a holiday house on a river. And I've never been as rich since as I was when I was at 25. Even now, 20 years later, I'm not that rich. And I did this for a while and I was just striving very hard to be successful and I guess the original rush of doing the HSC was exciting and then I was going through uni trying to beat everyone else and get all the scholarships and I was trying to beat everyone else on all the assignments and then when I got into the workplace I was trying to be the best and I was working hard and the clients would call me instead of other people and then I got an office that was bigger than other people and I got promoted faster and I was just doing all this stuff and I was racing and racing and racing and then I went to my high school reunion and it was funny, it was the first time I'd sort of ever had a pause because I'd been racing, 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 racing. And there I was, and I think I had the world's earliest midlife crisis. Because you know, everyone has a midlife crisis. And a midlife crisis is when you suddenly, you turn 40 or 50 or something, and you look around and you think, this is not where I wanted to be. This is not my beautiful house. This is not my beautiful wife. And you think, how, how did I get here? <laughs> the, and you, and you remember when you were a kid and everything was so exciting and fun and all the things you wanted to do and be, and that was so exciting. And then you think, but now I'm here and this sucks and it's boring. And so various people do different things. Just looking at my friends when they ha have this thing, it's just when everything quietens down, they start to think about the big picture. And then they either divorce their wives or have an affair or something really disgusting like that, or they, um, 
or they just get a fast car or they try and be super successful at business or whatever. But anyway, at, at this young age of mine, when I had a very early midlife crisis, so presumably I'm not going to live very long, um, I decided, what am I doing? I'm spending all of my life just making rich people richer. That's all I was doing, and me richer along the way. And I was constructing, using maths, which I love so much, to construct complex financial instruments which would make my firm vast amounts of money and um, the firm that my firm consulted to vast amounts of money and incidentally would make me vast amounts of money. But actually in the whole scheme of things in the world, I wasn't healing people, you know, I wasn't solving science problems, I wasn't improving anything at all, I was just a parasite essentially in the financial system, sucking money from one spot and moving it to another spot and taking a healthy commission on the way. I was. Macquarie Bank, essentially. <laughs> I was Goldman Sachs. And I looked around and thought, what am I doing with my life in this quiet time? And I thought, this sucks. I should work out what I really want to do, and then I should do that. I shouldn't do this other stuff, because it's not the right thing to do. It's not making me happy. I'm going to have a horrible life. So I decided, what I really want to do is think about problems. So I came back to uni and did some thinking for a while. And while I was at uni, I started teaching. And I thought, no, what I really want to do is teach, because there's nothing better in the world than teaching, because you help people and you get to make a difference, or you think you do. And, and it's just really cool. It's just the best job ever. And now, in my poverty-stricken life, I'm happier than I could ever be. And I watch all my friends who are now successful and wealthy, but going through midlife crises. And I think, oh, OK, you're in the middle too. So everything gets to be the middle. Now, I think when you go to uni, you start off thinking you want to do some degree. Maybe uh, I feel particularly sorry for the people who do med or law or something like that, because they jump in in the excitement of doing well in the HSC, and they pick these careers. And then maybe halfway through, and a lot of doctors and lawyers don't happen until they're 30 or 40, they suddenly think, how did I even get to here? I don't want to be a doctor. I don't want to be a lawyer. I just did this race. So, so this comes back to this notion of incremental versus one-off design. This is why I keep thinking about this thing. And I look at all these books, and I brought some of the books in to show you. Uh, here are two interesting science fiction books, and I've just read the middle book in both of these series. One is uh, the Philip Joe's Farmer Riverworld series. It's a science fiction book. I don't know if everyone's written it. You probably haven't, because if you turn it this way, it almost disappears. <laughs> so it wouldn't be called a book these days. It would be called, what, a first chapter or something like that. Uh, uh, that's To Your Scattered Bodies Go. It's a brilliant series. This is uh, Roger Zelezny's book, Nine, Nine Princes in Amber. Again, gone, back. Brilliant, brilliant book. I've read the middle book of both those series. And I was thinking, uh, as I read them, these series are awesome. These are so good. I don't think there are any other books as good as these series. They are just so full of ideas, and they're absolutely fantastic. But when I read the middle books in the series, I suddenly realize, Oh, this, is, this guy's lost the plot. And I remember they had a really exciting end at the end of the series, and the beginning was so full of potential. But I don't think the author in these two books here actually had a big design up front. I think what he did was he just had a series of ideas, and he introduced new ideas, and he knew the things he liked, and he kept putting them in the books. And he just sort of wondered which way the books go. And I don't watch TV anymore, but in the old days when I used to watch TV, I noticed that about lots of TV shows, something like... Um, Lost was the example I was going to say, that he had maybe one idea of where he wanted it to go, but other than that, he didn't really have an idea, and he just sort of meandered around sort of thing. And it got, I'm guessing, lost in the middle. I only saw the first episode series and then vowed I'd never see any more. Um, but maybe it got really good at the end, but I'm pretty sure there were about 100 series of it based on the rate of which new ideas were coming forward in it. He could have made it go for 100 series. Has it gone for 100 series? Six. Six. That's right. And what was series four like? Pretty crap. Pretty crap. Ah, woo -hoo. OK, I'm not, not rejoicing in the crapness of series four, just rejoicing in the prediction of the, how the universe works. Whereas then on the other hand, I have this DVD series that I watched in the middle of called Sea Change. And you guys probably haven't seen it because it's before your time, but it's about a woman who goes through a midlife crisis and decides to chuck in her job as a powerful lawyer and goes to work in a small village um, by the beach and just do good and get to know her family and things like that. And I think it must be the best series ever made. It's just so amazingly good. Has anyone seen it? What do you think? It's, it's amazing. How could you see it? It was like before you were born. Your mum. Yeah. God bless mums. That mum and I, watch, Kate and I sit there watching it and the girls go, Dad, this is boring. I go, no, it's the best series ever, man. I think it would have to be the best. Now, the interesting thing about this, if you were going to watch this, is I think they did a big design up front. Because in this series here, everything at the end comes together and makes sense. And it's very clear to me after watching it to the end, because I watched them all. I liked it so much when I did my experiment that themes were appearing early that were picked up later on and tied together in such a way, I don't think it would have been possible to incrementally design this show. And I was thinking about what Kathy Jinks was saying when she was in here. And she was talking about how she designs her novels. And do you remember she said she does a big design up front, 
And I said, what do you, why do you do that? And she said, because in the middle, do you remember she said this? In the middle, when you're up to chapter 7 and it, you're just sick of the whole damn thing, it gives you, you just keep powering on because you've got that skeleton. You know what you've got to do and what's got to happen, so you just keep going. And I think, okay. So the big design up front is sort of good for the middle because when it's the middle and everything goes all blah, you know where you're going, so it sort of guides you. And then I thought about my own life and thought, yeah, but the big design up front sucks in the middle if you made the wrong big design up front. So I think this is where the design idea comes. Big design up front, if you can do it, makes something amazing. But the danger is, it might be a crap design up front. And then you're stuck with this crap thing. Whereas the incremental thing, mm, it gets a bit hard around the middle because you don't really know where you're going and what's happening and what's going on. But if things go off the rails, you can always get back on the rails because you're not committed to some big infrastructure that you think you're making small local decisions and moving it on. So at the end, I thought, gee, I sort of like big design up front and I like incremental design. Uh, so that were my thoughts about that. Uh, now, I had something to say to you, though, which was... In the Lord of the Rings speech, that's right, that's where I'm coming to. Remember we played the Lord of the Rings speech? The one that Sam said when they're stuck in the middle of the boring thing and Frodo's going, I just want to give up, man. And Sam says, oh, Frodo. Frodo. Um, Mr. Frodo. Who said that? Who said that? You're so good. Say that again louder. Mr. Frodo. Oh. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, I'm very impressed. He says, can you do the whole speech? Do you know it? Or just... Oh, uh, no. No. The only line I remember is, I might not be able to carry the ring. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, that's so good. So, well done. Um, so I think there, what's happening is they've got the big design up front. So they're lost in the middle of their quest, but they've got a reason to keep going on. So I think we need some big design up front. Yeah, I'm not conv completely convinced by these people that say iterative design leads you to the best thing. But I've also seen so many examples, mainly amongst my friends, of people who have made, committed to a big design up front and it's a, the wrong design. And I, I see that more often. I think the people that live the happiest lives amongst my friends are those that didn't have a big design up front. And instead, whenever they had a decision to make, make local decisions. And they thought, well, I do this course or that course. And they think, I like this course. I don't like that course. I'll do this one. And they, will I do this or will I do that? They just made local decisions about what made them sort of happier at that instant and what they thought was the right thing to do. Rather than having some big plan, my parents want me to be a dentist, so for the next three years I won't have any friends until I get the right HSC mark I need, and then I'll travel interstate to another uni because I had the best dentistry course. And, da -da 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 -da. and you get to be 30 and you're a dentist, but you don't have any friends, you don't have any life, and you've got lots of money, but who cares because you're a dentist, man. <laughs> and everyone that comes to see you doesn't want to be there, and you're starting to think, oh, what have I done? So I think the big plan up front doesn't work for your life because essentially you're making the decision. You're committing to the big plan up front before you've got all the information. You're an idiot, aren't you? You're like 15 or 16 when you commit to your plan. Who wants to commit to a plan at 15? Who would trust a 15 or 16 year old to make a decision like that? Yeah, they're hopeless, aren't they? Completely hopeless. Thank heavens I don't have the vote. I think only a wise older person could make a decision like that. So I think uh, there's advantages to both. Certainly for software, I must admit, I've seen more systems fail because of a stupid big design up front that was never delivered than I've seen by people doing the incremental development. The incremental development, to me, in my experience, nearly always works and turns out something that's reasonably good. Now, maybe it's not as good as sea change. Maybe it's not as good as if you did the big design up front and you pulled it off and it was awesome. But I don't know. It's pretty damn good. And the risk of it, and I think it has a lower downside risk of not working. Okay, so that were my design thoughts at the moment. I hope you have design thoughts all the time and you're thinking about them and things. I think about design all the time while I'm teaching this course because I'm trying to fit into your heads. Yeah, so everywhere I go, I'm thinking about, eh, let's see, what, why did they do that and what's going on? And I, yeah, yeah, yeah. So hopefully you're doing that and writing down thoughts about that in your journal. I'm not trying to stress you, but I'm trying to encourage you to have thoughts like that and write them in your journal because I think thinking about things is what's going to lead you to be a good designer rather than not being a reflective person. Not being a reflective person will end you up at Macquarie Bank with a midlife crisis, a fast car, a bald head, a 19-year-old wife, and a fairly depressed feeling. Okay. Yeah, 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 no, that's, that's, that's what, what? <laughs> so, no one said that before. I like red cars. Okay, um, 
Okay. Oh, yeah, and the last middle is the middle we're just about to get to, which was I really liked it when the Greeks had all these crazy ideas about embracing change and decentralizing control and having faith in people, that people can do things, and criticizing the system and encouraging critiquing, and they all made fun of each other, and they did the plays and made fun. And essentially, the Greek system, as it was set up, was this amazing system that transformed the world, introduced ideas at a rate that had never been seen in civilization before, and it was completely amazing. And then the Romans came along and they copied some of it, but they were basically not really getting it right. And they were still trying to have an oligarchy and they were sort of said they had a democracy, but it wasn't really, it was sort of the aristocrats running everything. And they sort of did some stuff and they lasted a while and they had a big empire and they're certainly very rich. They were all Goldman Sachs, but um, that sort of didn't work so well. And eventually that disintegrated and we had like Attila the Hun and all that sort of stuff. And then <laughs> dark ages. And there was the middle, okay? It was just like <laughs> nothing happening and it was really depressing. And then Bang! We came out of it into the Enlightenment, and that was fantastic. Now, two books I've got, two last books from my show and tell before we start talking about design patterns again. Uh, my wife got me these awesome books. One was The Twelve Caesars. This is a history written by uh, Suton Suetonius. Suetonius? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is an edited one, okay? It's based on the Robert, Robert Graves, the guy that wrote I, Claudius. I don't know if anyone's seen I, Claudius. This is like a cut-down version of it. And as I read it, following all the Caesars from uh, basically Julius Caesar all the way through to Nero and, well, all the other ones, I got depressed and bored and thought, I hate the Romans. They're horrible. They're boring. And there's nothing really good there. I like the Greeks more. So if you were to ask me now which I like most, do I like, the, uh, do I like Sparta? Was that awesome? Because they did all that fighting and that was really cool. Or do I like Athens? Or I do like Rome? I would at first say, well, you know, each in their own way is pretty good. But then I'd say, no, Athens. By all means, it would be Athens, I reckon. So it's already on the way out, OK? They've, they've stopped being a republic. The time we're up to now is we're on our little journey through history. They've stopped being a republic. Even though Caesar's running it and still calling it a republic, it's an empire now carrying out Caesar's will. There's no real faith in the people. It's just rich bastards oppressing other rich bastards. And the empire slowly crumbles and disintegrates. And no really cool ideas come out of it anymore. Well, some good ones. We've got plenty and things like that. But basically, uh, it's on the way out. And nothing's going to happen now for a long time. And the other book I got was to Helen back. And uh, this was, I first heard about this book watching The Young Ones. I don't know if anyone's seen The Young Ones. This is a famous book, uh, Sidney Locke, and as I told you about it last week uh, in my um, embarrassing talk about Anzac Day that I hope I haven't recorded and will never show anyone because um, I would be asked to leave the country. But um, <laughs> Sidney Locke was a soldier. He wrote an account of uh, Gallipoli and what happened at Gallipoli and uh, he published it. He revealed that it was true and the book was banned. As a young soldier on the battlefields of Gallipoli, Sidney Locke witnessed the horrors of war firsthand. On his return to Australia, he wrote an account of all he saw, describing his work as a novel to evade Australian censorship. As the war ground on abroad and battles raged at home over conscription, Sidney's book, The Straits Impregnable, garnered a widespread literary acclaim. But when the publisher revealed that it was a work of non-fiction, Australian military censors swiftly ordered it to be withdrawn from sale and the book vanished but it came out in the 96 again. Here's an edited version of it with commentary. It's awesome. I told my wife about it and she went up and found a copy of it in the library for me. And I'm reading that now. That's absolutely amazing. And so 95 years ago today, the Anzacs had been at Sydney Cove for one day and they were being dreadfully slaughtered and terrible things were happening. And this was to be kept a secret from the Australian public at home, the incredible disaster that it was and how hopeless the whole thing was. And they were to stay there for months and months. And like every day if you thought about it and thought about all the atrocities that happened today and all those young, hopeful, brave Australian soldiers that died today, you could think that every day for the rest of this semester and for all of next semester and until January the, I think, 9th or something next year. And that's when finally the scandal was revealed, the, the incredible incompetence and hopelessness of that campaign. And through pressure from Britain and the British press, not from the Australian press, who still thought it was awesome that we were over there dying so bravely, um, the campaign was wound up and Churchill resigned. So that's a terrible, terrible thing that happened. But the other terrible thing that happened on the same day, literally at the hour, literally almost the hour, it was like midnight on the 24th, so presumably the Anzacs were trying to land then, the Turks, at that stage the Ottoman Empire, began an incredible massacre of the Armenians. It was absolutely amazing. Now, Ataturk, 
eventually to be the father of Turkey, was a pretty awesome guy from what I've read about it, though it might be biased readings. And when the Anzacs were leaving, he was fighting at Gallipoli. He was leading the Turks at Gallipoli or in a senior role at Gallipoli. And when the Turks were leaving Gallipoli, when the Aussies were leaving Gallipoli and the New Zealanders and the Indians and everyone else was leaving Gallipoli, he said, and the men wanted to fire on them as they were leaving, and he said, no, let them go, they're going home to their wives. He was nice, he was magnanimous. He said, they're people just like us, although they were people trying to invade us and take over our country, but he said, let them go, it's okay, we'll let them go, we won't try and kill them. And that was really cool. But at the same time, Turkey was committing this incredible atrocity. I don't know if anyone's read the book Bluebeard by Kurt Vonnegut. And Armenians were being killed at an incredible rate. Now the figures differ depending who you believe, but Turkish figures place it at about six or seven Armenians were killed. Um, the Armenians claim it was one and a half million were wiped out over the next year or two. Um, certainly historical figures suggest it's more than one million. And they did terrible, terrible things. The Germans watched on learning and guessing and, and, and approving and being silent. Some Germans didn't. Some took photos of what was happening and wrote home. But these accounts were heavily censored. And uh, in fact, you were jailed if you were talking about what the atrocities that were going on there. Um, so good things and bad things were both happening. That was under the Ottomans, not under the Turks. But for some reason now in Turkey, even though Turkey then had this thing under, uh, under Ataturk and became a country, and Ataturk did these amazing things. And he tried to rush through the whole of enlightenment in one or two years. And he did amazing things to bring democracy to Turkey. It's still, for some reason, un-Turkish. And as you know that, or as you may know, that's a serious offense in Turkey, acting un-Turkishly, you can be jailed for that. To even talk about it or to suggest that it was a genocide or to mention that it happened. So it's terrible. Is that why you play system of down? That, yeah, system of down are Armenians. Yeah. Because they were active yeah. in that time. Yeah, they're four Armenians in, in America, but yeah, yeah. Okay, so terrible censorship happening about that. No one was allowed to know about that. Terrible censorship happening about Anzac Day. Terrible, terrible censorship. Terrible, terrible censorship. We don't like censorship. I think more information is always good, less is bad. Now, let's now return to talking about design patterns uh, on this auspicious day. We've, as I said, we're just really looking at the issue of construction. There are many things to look at. There are many interesting design issues in object-oriented design. And to master them all, you really should get this book, the pattern book, and read through it. And you should get the refactoring to pattern book and read through that, and you will improve enormously as a coder doing that. But in this course, we're just going to focus on two patterns. And the two patterns we're going to look at are the abstract factory and the factory method. Now, a factory is an object that makes objects. So we had some interesting questions from people before, and you were inching towards talking about the factory method. Someone said, who calls? Where does this method live? Because if you want to create a new guy, how can you call a method? Because a method has to be called on an object. A constructor is the only thing you can call not on an object, because it's a class method, essentially. But if you want to call a method on an object, you have to have an object first. So how can you have one of these construction methods? Where does it live? It can't live on an object, because the object can't make itself, because it's not yet been made. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I know, if you remember, I answered saying there's sort of two approaches. One is you could have it as a static method. It's essentially being like a constructor. And the other one is you could have another object making it for you. Now, what we've talked about so far was sort of the static method approach. And what I'm going to talk about now is two different ways of doing it, two design patterns. We haven't yet seen a design patterns. These things are moving towards the design patterns. The um, having named construction methods is a reasonable idea, but it's not yet a design pattern. We're going to use those named construction methods in a particular way to give us a nice design pattern. So the two approaches we're going to have is one is a class-based approach where we're going to do some sort of thing with a static constructor to build our objects, and the other one is an object-based approach where we're going to ask objects to make objects for us. And these are all going to solve some interesting problems, basically about who needs to know about how to build an object and how tightly are we going to be coupled to our objects that we create. All right, so let me go. All right, we've got a maze example. Oh, sorry, guys. Uh, Here's the maze example from the Gang of Four book, uh, which oh, I left in the car, curses. And notice again I'm using their examples because I like their examples, and I really like the idea of reusing. Oh, yeah, Richard talked about that too. That's something I was going to say. Richard talked about when I said, why do you think it is, because he said it was a smell if a game was created and it looked like Monopoly. Remember, he said that was a smell. And I was trying to tease out why that was a smell. And he says, because it was created by someone that hasn't played many games. Normally, that indicates. And 
I'm thinking, okay, that's a smell too. That's still not an obvious bad thing. That's presumably on the path to being bad. So I said, why is it bad for a game to be created by someone who hasn't played many games? And do you remember what his answer was? What's that? They haven't learned from good design. Yeah, he literally said the standing on the shoulders of giants thing. Yeah, he said standing on the shoulders of giants. And that's what he means. There's a huge body of experience around. They're not building on that. There's a series of traps and pitfalls lying around which are easy to fall into. They all fall into those again. And we see that with our code all the time. For some insane reason, I know I've ranted about this before, we think it's completely fine when we sit around to write a piece of software that's 99% similar to hundreds of other pieces of software. It's only different in one small percent of the way. We think it's completely fine to just scrap everything and start from scratch and build it all ourselves. And we're just reinventing the wheel over and over again. And in games, the consequence of that is you end up with a crap game because you'll make mistakes that people have made before. And it doesn't mean you have to have a long shopping list of mistakes people have made before and write games not to have those. Yes, that would be boring. It instead means you use all those things that people have done before and the mistakes they've found to raise you up high and then you do amazing work up high. Yeah, so you're standing on the shoulders of giants. Yeah, that's what he said. So it's the same with just about everything in life and in particular about examples when I'm teaching, I think, that the Gang of Four book has lots of good examples in it, so I would be hypocritical not to use those examples, even though for pride reasons I'd like to think of my own examples and reinvent the example. I thought I'd rather spend spare time talking about Gallipoli and important things like that than wasting time thinking of examples when there are perfectly good examples already. Okay, so the Gang of Four maze example is, I've got the code here. You've got a maze. This is our class. You've got a maze game that creates a maze, and a maze has rooms and doors and walls. So what we do is we first of all create a maze, then we create a room in another room, then we create a door that joins room one and room two, then we add the rooms to the maze, and then we, um, set w we create walls for each of the rooms, uh, and three sides of each room is a wall, and one side is the door, and we, put the we connect the door to join the rooms together. Yep, so we're just doing a whole lot of object connection. Can everyone see that? So this is our code to create a maze. Now, presumably you can look at that and it all makes sense and you see how it works. But this code is sucky code. What's the matter with this code? What's the smell? There's lots of repetition. Yes, absolutely. Uh, this and that are the same. Probably those functions need to be moved off into the room or something like that, don't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it has, they have to go somewhere, those functions. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's something that doesn't even have to be there. We can, we can move stuff around. Uh, well, this create function is doing a lot of work to create this maze, and the constructor's not really doing anything. Yeah, the, the create is making, yeah, the constructor, well, okay, so George's issue was the constructor's not doing much work, the create function's doing a lot of work. Absolutely, that's true. In a sense, that might not be bad in that you might want to have maze being a very generic thing and you instantiate it to different mazes and you might then say the, what's important about the different mazes, um, oh, we're not running out of battery, I hope. Uh, what's important about the different mazes uh, should belong in the constructor for the, the creation method for those mazes. Yep? You're doing work to set up the rooms inside of setting up the maze. We're doing work to set up the rooms inside of setting up the maze. Yep, yep. Though maybe... Maybe we need to do that because maybe the rooms do belong to the maze. So if there's this ownership thing between them, then I guess temporarily it makes sense that we create them while we're creating the thing that owns them. But yeah, there's certainly different things going on there. But do you remember when I said the Gang of Four, they had their two big sort of design things that we should always be hunting for? What are the two big design principles? And now we're talking high level design principles we should be aiming for. Design to an interface. Now here, are we designing to an interface? No. No, we're not. How can you tell we're not? <coughs> yeah, we're creating new mazes, new rooms, and new doors. So they've got to be classes, concrete classes. And we're saying our maze is composed of these classes, and we're naming the classes. So we've got a, a higher level object, the maze, that has lower level components and we're locking it into particular classes for those lower level components. We're programming to a class, not to an interface. If we were doing um, uh, 
you know, uh, in, in dependency inversion properly, how we would do it is we would say, I've got this higher level thing that's a maze, it consists of components, but I'm not committing myself now to which particular file the code for those components is in. I'm not committing myself to a particular class. I'm happy to have any implementation of room, any implementation of wall, any implementation of door. Advantages of that, if I stop programming to the actual classes and programmed instead to an interface, what bangs for the buck does that give me? Everything would still work exactly like it is it now, but there's an advantage to doing that. What's the advantage? Hang on, let's. You don't have to change the code if. If. If you're changing the. Of. Which interface? <laughs> Concretely, in this case. I'm just trying to make it really concrete. In this. Oh. <laughs> that, no, you, I mean, you're dead right. You're absolutely right. I just want you to say. Say the word. Say it. <laughs> uh, if you change what a room is. Suppose you've got different sorts of rooms. You might want to have a maze which has the same maze layout but it's got different sorts of rooms. Maybe you need magic rooms or fairy rooms or rooms with bombs in them or something like that. More than four sides. Well, if you've got rooms with more than four sides, oh, well, actually, that actually, that might be hard. That sort of flexibility I don't think we're going to add now. If you want to add that sort of flexibility, we'll need another pattern. Yep. Right. Yep. But the pattern we're trying to solve here is the decoupling pattern where we're not locked to a particular, well, yeah, maybe there's, maybe there's more than four sides. Okay. But we've only got an interface that gives us access to four, but maybe we've got five sides, and every time someone goes through a door, the, the room rotates or something, like one of those old horror films. So you only ever see four at a time, but the room magically is changing underneath you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, you're right. We could actually change the number of walls or other crazy features. And we'd like, um, we'd like here not to be coupled to those particular classes so we have the flexibility to do that sort of thing. Now you might say, oh Richard, whenever you create a maze, at that instant you know everything you need to know about the rooms and the walls and the doors and I don't need any sort of flexibility and I would have to say, I don't know if you do or not because it's mazes, we just made it up, it's an example, it's a maze. I don't know what can change and what can't change. Um, so it's a very simple example. So maybe to you, mazes are something there's only one type of and they can never change, in which case this won't be compelling, but hopefully you can see that you could have different sorts of mazes and you could imagine a world in which someone might want to change what a room means or what a door means or a wall means or how they're implemented. And if you can imagine such a world, we're stuffed if we have this code. We can never change it without recompiling and changing all this. And if the people changing the walls and the doors and the rooms live in a different land to us who's now writing the maze control stuff, the maze game thing. What's it called? Maze. What was the file called? Maze game. If ours is in a package and they're using it to instantiate some other game they're making and they can't just go and recompile our code, maybe we haven't even given them the source code, so they're stuck with our class files, then they're doomed. We'd like our system to be flexible enough so that other people, without needing to change our stuff, can change the overall behaviour of the system by composing objects. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so how can we change this? Well, there's two um, basic approaches. There's hundreds of ways of doing it, but two approaches we'll look at today. One is um, we can use inheritance. This uses the inheritance mechanism. And we can have named constructors for all the things we want to construct. And people that want to change this can subclass us, can subclass maze game and provide new, new named construction methods, override our old construction methods, and that will change the nature of the game. Ah, before saying this, maybe I should explain the template pattern to you, because we're so close to the template pattern, I should probably explain it, because this is really the template pattern. The template pattern goes like this. You've got a parent class that does some stuff. Now, you would like to be able to have children subclasses of it that do essentially the same stuff and benefit from all this code here but change little bits of it. Like maybe you've got, um, maybe you've got here a priority queue which inserts things and keeps them in order and occasionally has to sort and things like that and you might want to subclass it, it might have some sort of sort function in it. You might want to subclass it so it works exactly the same but uses some funky new sort function you've just come up with 
or which is appropriate to a new domain you're using this thing for. You might have a priority queue of a new class of objects. The old sort might be really inefficient for those. You might know enough about the domain now that you, if you could only change a sort and use a bucket sort instead of a quick sort, you know, you could speed it up by a factor of some enormous number. So you'd like to be able to create a new one of these guys and change the sort algorithm. You don't want to have to rewrite all the code. So here's how the template method works. It's the commonest and simplest method of all time. And to understand how this works, you have to understand the stuff we did in our quiz last week. Remember the quiz last week? In the quiz last week, I was talking about the difference between classes and types. And everything's just got a class, but it can have many types. Now, if you've got a parent class and they define a function, suppose a parent class defines two functions. And one calls the other. And then your child class overrides one of the functions, the one that gets called. Does the method in the parent class now call the overridden, the, the new method supplied by the child class, or does it call the original one in the parent class? And remember, we all thought about it, and most people got it wrong. So if you're just using your common sense, then flip the answer, because the answer is, which one gets used by the parent? The child's method. Which means, which is nice, which means you can have a priority queue and you can write it and give it all the interface functions you need for a priority queue and then you can subclass it and down here you just override the sort function. And you make sure you write the algorithm up here so that it calls this internal sort function and you sort of, and then you make that available to be overridden down below and then people can override it and they end up with a priority queue that has now a different sort behavior. Does that make sense? And that's called the template method whenever you do that. Essentially, the template method is the big method up here that calls these other sub-functions that you overwrite down here, and that changes the behavior of the template method. Now sometimes the template method might do things called calling a hook. Maybe the template method is something that draws an object on the screen. And maybe before drawing it on the screen, it calls a method called get ready, I'm about to draw, and then it draws it on the screen, and then it calls a tidy up, I've just finished drawing method. And then both of these methods are implemented in the parent, and you just make them do nothing. But you make them overridable. Does that make sense? And now a child can come along and override one of these two methods. They get to use all the logic that's in the parent about rendering the thing on the screen, but they can now specify something that has to happen just before it's drawn on the screen, or something that happens just after it's drawn on the screen. Does that make sense? It's a template method. Yes? Just the word hook. Hook. What is that? The description of the hook. No. Template method is you've got a method that calls submethods, and your children override the submethods. A hook is a particular sort of sub-method that you put in the template method that does nothing by default. You're only putting it there so the child can override it, and the child overrides it to add extra functionality in. So a hook might be, I say, the Richard method does get ready for lecture, give the lecture. And maybe at the moment, get ready for the lecture, if it was a hook, if it wasn't a hook, I'd have something in there for get ready to the lecture. And then the child could override me and change my lecture preparation by overriding that. If it's a hook, then um, uh, it's, there's nothing happening there and the child can make me do something before the lecture that I wouldn't normally have done. Does that make sense? So actually, I always do do something before the lecture. So maybe you've got Richard gives lecture, which is going to be the template method, the method you can modify. The Richard gives a lecture method does a whole lot of work, prepares for the lecture, then does a walk across and then gives a lecture. And walk across is currently nothing. And you can override it, and now you can have me cartwheel across and do all sorts of things. So you're adding extra functionality that wasn't previously there, but you had to envisage that it might possibly to be there when you wrote this, and then you'd put a hook in to let other people use. So a hook is essentially you're writing a system, and you're putting some things in there that you're not going to use, but if other people want to, they can hook in there and do extra things. Yes, yes, yes. It allows other people to modify the behavior. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully you condone anything because um, the people doing this are overriding you. They're writing their own class. Let them do whatever they want. You don't have to be all Australian government censorship bureau and say, you can do this, you can't do this, this is good for you, this is bad for you. I reckon you say, use my code, go for it. Do whatever you want. That's fine. Yeah, so I don't really like the idea that you put all these constraints on your children because you know best. I think yeah, maybe someone will come along and think something crazy that would be really good to do. And if you put some arbitrary rule in, because you could never imagine why anyone would want to do that, you might be constraining them from doing it. So I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Does that all make sense? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So that's template method. That's a really common pattern. That's a design, one of the design patterns. Now, oh, oh, we're almost out of time. 
Okay, that's all right. We'll just finish factory uh, method and we can talk about abstract factory before we start the day. Or not. Gone to sleep. Doesn't matter. I can finish it without that because it's only going to take a second to finish. So factory method goes like this. I, and I have some code. I'll put up the code so you can see because I've actually implemented it in code. But unfortunately my laptop's asleep now so you can't see it. Factory method looks like this. I um, I write a method that, uh, no, I'm not going to get it exactly right. I write a method that constructs the object I want. But it doesn't construct it to a particular class. It constructs something of a particular type. Okay, so maybe an interface. So it makes a maze where there's no concrete maze class. And then I override that with a I, I write a child of that method, and in the child, I override the constructor method to make a particular sort of maze. Does that make sense? So up front, I've got some make a maze function that returns something of type maze. I haven't implemented it. It would have to be abstract because you can't make something of type maze. Yeah, yeah, because maze is an interface. So I say this function returns something of type maze, and then the child comes along and overwrites this abstract make, make the creation function with a particular one that makes a concrete class. Does that make sense? So if you want to change the actual um, sort of maze that gets created, you don't want to be tied to a particular maze, you want to change the sort of maze that gets created, you create a new child that overwrites a constructor, the construction method, to return something of that particular class. So now changing the class that gets created is as easy as inheriting from my object that has the construction method, in, the factory method in it, and concretely saying what the factory method returns. Does that make sense? So through inheritance then, we can create an object of any class that implements the maze interface simply by writing a new subclass Mm -hmm. So many words, and hands waving, and I have the code, I'll put the code up. So you might even want to read about it between now and then. And on Thursday, I'll, start, I'll talk about abstract factory, which is the other con main constructor method pattern, and then we're done. Okay. I'm sorry we ran out of power. That was very sad, just at the end. <laughs>